What I'm going to do this evening is a kind of a talk around, like a pre-launch talk around this box set that the Test Centre have put together, based out of archives from the 70s that I have of tapes, because at that time we collected tapes, everything was on tapes. Um, and I have not lost them, and in fact, not one of them has got any <coughs> damage to it, whether it be on the shelves in the living room or the shelves in my work room, whereas I know other people have uh, problems with some of their tapes. Anyway, it relates to a magazine that I was doing in the 70s, through the 70s, called Curtains. And this is the very first one. They're not all fallen apart, but this is the one that's mm -hmm. on my shelf, which is... I have one in the cupboard, which is in pristine condition, well, almost pristine condition. It was called Curtains, and that is the only issue that was actually called Curtains. After that, like, they had different titles. And the back was fallen off. It had bullet holes in, like it's curtains for you, baby. <laughs> and this is actually number 13, it says, because they were all obviously numbered. So that's how lucky it was. Um, <coughs> and the last one, which was you know, like not 10 years later, but at the end of the decay, was at this size by then. That was done mim uh, mimeographed, and by then we were doing litho printing. This one's about 170 something pages. The one before that was 214 pages, and they're extremely dense in, uh, in typing all the plates. Everything was completely full up all the way through. This one was about censorship. That's what girl comes from Northern Ireland, Lane Shamilt. There's Eureka Meinhof about her in the, being tortured. <coughs> um, there's Percy Benetuti and Monte Casas are there. Anyway, there was a lot of things in these things. And in the, in the middle somewhere, there was one that I put into an envelope called Range of Curtains, where it was stapled in sections. And Someone complained. I'm not going to say who. They complained in their magazine, saying you should, you don't put a magazine in an envelope. I'm afraid you do. <laughs> but his magazine was a tedious magazine anyway. Um, so that's just three of them. This is like a triple, quadruple issue now. We actually did do another one afterwards. In a sense, it was just a, like a live issue at the London Musicians Collective. <coughs> purposely not documented. The only evidence around is this publicity sheet that I did beforehand. And David Barton did drawings which were then projected onto a screen and talked it through. So there's no evidence on that. Uh, Hazel Smith was a solo violinist. She played with Lysis. Um, she played a piece called Agorithms by Say it. She was in the name for so long. Nicothetis, who's a Greek composer. She actually played another piece by called Variations by Lyle Creswell. <coughs> there was an actress called Roxana, it's not the one that's written on here, which was Francis Lowe. It was Roxana Zielowski. Uh, and she did a play of mine, which is in three parts. She did one in the past called Isabel. And what else do we do? I read pieces from Hans, no, not Hans Pelmer. I think I read some, yeah, I read some pieces by various people. Oh, Roger Laporte. Um, I can't remember. Wait, here we go. Roger Laporte, Bernard Noel, Pierre Guillotin, Daniel Colbert. These are people that nobody has knew anything about other than what they read in curtains, or Pierre Guillotin hadn't been in curtains at that point, but I had put him in something else. I was the person who was first published Eat and Eat and Eat and in three different places, and kind of forced the hand of people to do it as a book. Anyway, that doesn't exist except for that one sheet, and I only found one sheet in my archive, so that's a photocopy of that sheet, which we're always going to have afterwards. Um, that's the only evidence we have, other than in people's memories. No one took any photographs. In those days, you hardly anyone took photographs. So, there was this magazine called Curtains, and it wasn't always called Curtains. It had titles like A Range of Curtains, Bald Curtains, but it's not actually bald, it's B-A-L, 
colon le colon d. So there's the le, the masculine thing there, curtains, for various reasons, <coughs> uh, which was in, talking about male, female. Although there was a lot of women in my magazine, in general there were not many women being published at all, either as poets or as artists. I mean, I had Susan Hiller, Gina Pane, um, and the women, it's a long list of them really, Lydia Davis, and there was Glenda who's my book um, with me, Rosemary Wardrop, um, etc. Daniel Colibert, Eureka Meinhof. Um, and then other issues were called things like drawn curtains, French curtains, velvet curtains, split <laughs> curtains. So I was actually disrupting, the whole idea was to disrupt the concept of libraries. I like to click things and nicely categorize everything. So I was breaking that down. So particularly in American universities, and they would just say, where's the next issue of split curtains? No, no, it's not cool. So you were having that game with them all the time. It was done on purpose. It was this disruption thing. And this is going to become apparent now that how we try to disrupt everything all the time. And although it's, it was kind of categorised as a poetry magazine, it was not a poetry magazine, it never was a poetry magazine, it has poetry in, but I was always interested in the area between poetry and prose. And that's even the first issue, which has Roy Fisher in. I was trying to get Roy to give me some of his prose, because although I started off working in better books under Bob Cobbing, uh, uh, it, it then went to, I was, I was asking people like Roy Fisher, who had published some prose with Fulton Press, because I worked for Fulton Press, and I was asking him for prose rather than poetry, because I was interested in that area between poetry and prose, which took me towards the French, but there were people in this country like Anne Quinn, who you call a novelist, but it wasn't quite being novels. B.S. Johnson was playing around with a novel, Alan Burns, but I didn't really like, Anne Quinn was the one who was being published by Cordial Boys that I liked the most and had a relationship with and everything. Uh, but basically it's going to be the poets, Doug Oliver, Jeff Nuttall, Martin Wright, who's Spanish, uh, David Coxhead, they, uh, who were writing, they were poets, but writing prose. And that's, I was trying to investigate that area, that's what my main interest at the beginning was. But when I went into the French, it became much easier, because you had someone like uh, Maurice Blanchot, uh, who no one knew at that point, uh, Georges Bataille, Roger Laporte, Bernard Noel, people involved with the Telkel group, Solaires and that, and I was picking up on uh, Plenet and Jacqueline Vissé. And then there was the Charge group, Jean-Pierre Fine, his group, which had Jacques Rubeau in, and uh, Mitsu Rona, Jean Carré, and I came past that. But then there was also the thing that branched off from Bataille and Blanche, Bernard Noel, Roger Laporte, and all these people. Plus there was a group of the poets, Claude Rangelon, <coughs> Amory and Albia, and a lot of them were poets, but a lot of them have slowly moved towards writing prose as well, and Vin Stein, Pascal Quignard, people like that. So these were all people that I was kind of mixing together. That was the intention of the magazine. But as we went into the 70s, um, <clears throat> I started to find artists that I wanted to put in there. Um, whether they were artists on the wall or whether they were performance artists, because performance started to take a part for me. And Genesis and Cozy, who had Coombe at the time, before, just before Throbbing Gristle, they had seen me doing a performance, and so they befriended me. In Paris, because I was interested in some of the uh, people to do with the body, so I had Gina Parne, and I used to see her. Stuart Brisley in this country, who was doing these long endurance things, that I spent time with him. And then I was writing to the Viennese school, Valley Export, and people like that, and she was sent to me things. She was the only one that really interested me, but she didn't really have new work for me, so although I got lots and lots of bits and pieces from her, Nothing ever found its way into the magazine. <clears throat> and then at the same time we had Brian Kathleen, who was a, a poet, who started moving into doing sculptural pieces. And he was introducing me to other people, and so they kind of found their way in as well. So we had this idea of performance, but I was interested in performance from the oral sense, whether it be in uh, kind of traditions, ethnic traditions, whether it be in poetry, music, art. And so that was kind of finding its way through as well. So therefore we get, for example, in the poetry we had this area <coughs> like um, Bob Cobbing, who I had worked for. In France we had people like Henri Chopin, 
um, Bernhard Sint, Volleman, who was one I kind of really related to, Dufresne, or you had the concept coming out of Artaud and his theatre work, because before I started doing this, I was actually a bit involved with the Royal Court, so I was actually interested in theatre, uh, but I was interested in theatre of cruelty uh, coming out of Artaud, so I was kind of steeped in that as well. So there's that kind of area, knowing what they were doing, or in the music sense, you'd either have someone like Captain Beefheart, or you'd have someone like Berio in that area, or you'd have vocalists such as Cathy Barbarian or Joan La Barbara, that other people, you know, it's this whole mix coming in. So that was what was informing me. And so the magazine started to come like that. So I thought I had to start doing some tapes. And for some reason, I have no idea why, it was Eric Mocham was coming to, into the air. We lived in Hebden Bridge, or outside Hebden Bridge. We'd moved from the south. And in fact, by living on the Pennines, completely inaccessible, except by car, we didn't have a car. It's three miles to walk down to Hebden Bridge. So basically, we were just working all day long, translating, which is why the magazine became so big, and we could just spend our days doing that. We weren't translators, we were just teaching ourselves, you know. And then along came people like Paul Oster and Lydia Davis and Rosemary Wardrop, um, who were doing very specific people. But I wanted the magazine to be very broad, to take on lots and lots of people, not just to dot in a few French poets. And so it became famous for that as well, for just this inundation of all these French writers and the spreading of that, which went through to America. And it, it meant that Blanchard got trans... Lydia was translating Blanchard, but she could then publish it with um, Station Hill, which was because of Robert Kelly and Adam Sidney, who was a, a film archivist, but who was interested in Blanchard as well. So it's a bit of a preamble. I wasn't going to say all that. Um, <laughs> So Eric Mocham was the first one, and he came and did a reading in our house. He only had about 50, oh, that was a bit smaller than this. We did have a sofa over there, and <laughs> some cushions there, and a table and all that. But he was squeezed in the corner, and uh, yeah, you know, and there was food. So we had a kind of half hour reading, then food, then half an hour again. And it was his books for sale. But Eric was not really known as a poet. He was known as a critic of... American poetry, American writing, and starting to take on some of the British. He'd come off, well, he'd written a book about Burroughs, because he was in, that's still one of the kind of key books written about Burroughs. <coughs> and, um, he started to pick up on some of the English writers, not so much the Cambridge poets, but the people like Alan Fisher, uh, Bill Griffiths, and people like that. But I was starting to read his poetry, so I said, well, you come to a reading in our house. And as you can imagine, not much space in a country road, so people all share cars. And I can remember, I could, I'm sure I could remember everyone if I really thought about it, but Mike Haslam was living next door. When I was listening to it yesterday, I can hear him, his voice, he's got such a distinct and additional voice. Jeff Nuttall was there, Bully McCarthy, or Lee Freer as he now is. Um, Jeremy Hilton was there, and Bill Sherman, which I only discovered recently, when they, that's where they actually met that evening. They were standing in front of me, sat in the region. He said, you know, we met at your place when Eric was, oh. So there was quite a few kind of poets there, but there were other people. There was a film producer, a television producer there from Yorkshire Television, who was a friend of Jeff's, I think. There was someone who lectured at um, Bradford. There was a potter. Um, a few other people. And it was about 15 or perhaps more. And so I'm going to play you a bit. So what we were doing, we were just recording, and we took, made the tapes. This is the master tape I'm playing from. And we've released them, well, I released it at the time, just by trimmed off my introduction, and I've done it again. I introduction, my introduction. And I feel a bit embarrassed by it, but so, it goes straight into Eric. Uh, but if I line this up in the right place. I hope I've arrived up in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, Eric has kind of talked to between pieces, which because it's what you don't get when you have published books. This was a piece I'm re playing from is actually in this book here. But they were all either mimeographed or very similar to these type of books at the time. Oh, 
obviously the wrong way. <laughs> Damn, does that mean there's my introduction? <laughs> it does, yeah. <laughs> no, this is the second. <laughs> this is after the break. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> it's very nice, I must say. I've got one or two requests <laughs> to read. So I'm going to start off with those. Um, I think I'll read the, the comical ones first. This, one of the things that I'm fascinated by is um, using another set of terms, another set of, uh, another kind of language on my own. That is to move down inside somebody else's terminology, somebody else, and just see what happens. When, it's like putting on somebody else's uh, role, somebody else's life, in a sense. And sometimes it can be funny, hopefully, <laughs> and sometimes it can be uh, a very strange proposition. Recently, I was reading Wynne Stanley's documents about the levelers and the diggers. You know, those very early communal Democrats in the 17th century, and using their language and see what happened there. I thought I'd put it on. That was rather serious for me. These are not so serious at all. I'm going to read three of them. What happens is this. In the first one, I'm using language of um, from the TV guide in America. And I thought I'd be able to look at all the descriptions of movies that occurred a week very quickly and transcribe them. The second one was uh, taking Eric Satie's descriptions of his own works and doing that very quickly. The third one was using the like uh, balloons and captions coming out of his head in a cartoonist called Crumb, R. Crumb, an American comic book writer who I'm extremely addicted to. And I read those for you, this, these are from Rolly McCarthy. It's part of a thing called Five Derivations, and it's in this book <coughs> for uh, the he expression. So the first one, then, was this uh, TV guy stuff. It's called Sunday Through Saturday. Sheriff Ben Sadler arrives at Golden Empire Ranch to investigate fatal beating of beating of Mexican laborer Stay Struck Prop Man, who works with a company of traveling actors, only survivors of the atomic war, reviving mankind's ancient hostilities and prejudices. A millionaire named Ezra Ounce wants to spend his money improving other people's morals instead of relatives' relatives who plot to use his money for musical comedy. And the new vet turns out to be Rhonda Fleming. <laughs> he especially remembers Armand, the charming anarchist whose attentions continued colorfully, whitewashed in this entertaining melodrama of old Missouri, as a 70-year-old man who can't convince the police or his family that Atlanta is not the right place for Scarface, <laughs> who desperately tries to avoid the draft, another slapstick, carry on about two rival companies, Wells Fargo and Perry Mason. <laughs> the now classic tale about a fun-loving prostitute and investigator for the World Health Organization. <laughs> <laughs> this parody of 1928 gangland Chicago story of Dalton Murphy, the Maryland physician who set John Wolfe to his fractured leg in order. <laughs> in order to gain military information from the Germans and begins expanding to alarming proportions, including <laughs> death and destruction after he jails the brother of the area's most powerful rancher, Dean Martin. A union officer imprisoned in downbeat tale of the bond between a priest and a bandit, the sheriff fired by Max to plan to revenge. So, but one of the reasons what <coughs> was good about it is you get the preamble, him explaining things, which you don't get in the books. And that's one of the nice things. And but other times other people would have edited things like that out and just keep the poems. And that's what I like about lots of these things, particularly when we go away from um, the things that were actually going to be released, which were like the private tapes. So, we were living in this inaccessible place. On the other side of the valley, just outside Sorby Bridge, was Bully was living there. He was called Rudy McCarthy at the time. <clears throat> and he used to come across to our house every now and then. I used to go across to his house, but that was only because Celia, his wife at the time, used to drop us off. Otherwise, we couldn't really get anywhere. We just used to meet at events in Bradford, Leeds, or Halifax, or something like that. But every time he came over, we'd put recorders on, and we'd record us reading to each other. So he'd read, I'd read. And um, 
or we'd even sit at a table and write. We did a piece called The Table, which is based out of uh, Robert Kelly. All these names, all interlinked, all these names that keep coming, like he's mentioning Sati there. Right? Um, Robert Kelly wrote about table that you sit, instead of sitting around in armchairs, you sit at a table when you're having a discussion with someone, a serious discussion, and you're kind of pushing the table that way, and they're pushing it back. That's what discussion is about, working at the table. So we use that, and I was writing one side, then I'd write something, then I'd pass it across, and he'd write something more, and he'd pass it back, which we then published in the most inaccessible book you can imagine. Um, it's folded in such a way that part of it is sticking out the bottom, which means it'll never stand up on a shelf. <laughs> it has to be sandwiched between things. It's got a piece of string coming out of the back, <laughs> and it's a mess in many ways. <laughs> Very rare to find it now. Most of them are, are damaged as well. Um, but, so I was doing my readings, and I was working through this concept of performance at the same time as using my voice from all these things that I was talking about when it comes from the kind of ethnic thing of listening to the, the pygmies or the uh, aboriginals from uh, Australianum land, for example, and the way they used their voice and what they were trying to do. And I was, I was slowly just building up this repertoire. And I was doing a piece, and this piece that I recorded a number of times, it's about sensory, it's about deprivation, sensory deprivation in different ways. And I was talking about Northern Ireland, um, where the British were torturing some of the people. In fact, some of the cuttings from that are in my scrapbooks, which I then used in the public intimacy, so I talk about it there. But they're also in this poem, which is we published as a book with the Cabinet Gallery at one point. It's one piece called XXX7. And, and I talk about Soweto. But this is the, the section I'm going to put on, if I put it on the right side, is where I'm going to dissociate my voice from my brain. I was interested, I was also working on how the brain works, what parts of the brain do, this, that and the other. And I wanted to switch it off so that it would just be noises, and then as I start to feed in and get some form of feeling and consciousness back, words would start to appear, or sounds would start to appear, which would start to form words, and then I would just start shaping it until it became words. And let's see what happens. I have to say it's very difficult for me to actually listen to this, because even though it's like 40 years ago, almost, it's almost as if it's yesterday, and when I put it on the other day, it kind of... It's a bosley thing, it's about body, and so it kind of gets into you. Hello! It's true. Identity. We, ourselves, wear the bike. Sections of gold to goodness without a harness. I see. In the immersion, sold as furniture and paysage, cat powdered, who is called Moon. I know what I put in. <laughs> no, it can't be. Trump, it's the master tape of volume, the master tape of me. Oh, no. Okay. Please, of the way a flesh pen would not disappear you. Wouldn't have dropped off. We're all watered here. We're perspiring little by little by step. See that sometimes I breathe sufficiently icicles without going 
because he got older, so he's still got this kind of built-in rhythm he's reading here. So we thought to put some music, we're using very primitive recording equipment, and it looked like that, but it was really primitive, that's more sophisticated. And, but we had another one playing on the other side of the room, and we put a tape on of Sati, which we thought was completely counter what he, to what he was about, but it was on a loop. You could get loops in those days. So it would play, and then it would come back, it would go silent for a while, then it would come back again. But as soon as it came in, it would distort, because it's all on automatic. We didn't have anything else. And so it would distort, so it floods him. But we like that. We like to play with that concept of the distortion. And this should be at the very beginning. because um, Bill Griffiths came by and so we recorded Bill Griffiths and we recorded Pierre Joris. But we had to leave really. A, because my magazine was having censorship problems um, in the local press and also with the Yorkshire Arts and with the Arts Council uh, saying that we were publishing a load of crap and all this type of stuff. We had Bataille, Blanchot, Joey Bousquet, you know, blah, 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 you know, all you could have and that. They thought this was all rubbish, Susan Hill. Um, but we also said so we had a son, and so if it was difficult for him to maintain being in a, a small um, village school, as we thought that was what was going to happen. And we did have the opportunity to come back down south to Maidstone. Also at the time there was the Yorkshire Ripper, and he was getting quite close to us. He was in uh, Halifax, and people were scared. We lived on the top road and a lot of walking, we just didn't know. We, no one had any idea. And something else which I should say, we had an Iron Jack phone call. At the time, the Yorkshire River was thought to be Iron Jack, but it wasn't actually said at the time. Uh, we actually received one of those, and Glenda picked it up, and she thought she thought it was Genesis Porridge. So, <laughs> typical, and well, and you know, on this kind of masturbatory type thing. So she kind of played along with it. I was talking to this guy. 
Then later on it came out that the person in charge of the Yorkshire Ripper said that there was these phone calls going around at Iron Jack, and it was probably the Yorkshire Ripper, because later on it turned out not to be. But that kind of freaks us out a bit. How did you get our number and all that? Glenda wrote a piece about it. I'm not sure she ever published it. Um, so that was another reason for us to kind of kind of move south. So we moved back down south and uh, sort of solved some of our problems. But Bill, Bill Griffiths had come by. He was doing something in the north, so he came by. But he also brought some other tapes with him, which we put on, which were distortions. But I can't play his because Kathy Acker's on the other side. You can you play? I don't know how I meant Bill when I get to that. So I'm not going to play Bill. But he came and did did a, a 45 minutes, which we were going to release. And then Pierre Joris came by, because he had to come by, because Pierre and I were both involved with um, the French poetry scene, me with Charge, Telkel, or whatever, and publishing in them. And he was working with Christian Borbar, translating lots of Americans into French. And he was asked if he'd want to do a, an anthology of uh, British poetry for the French. And I was asked by Charge if I wanted to do and, but, you know, not to do one that just the British would like, but one that the French could appreciate. In other words, people playing with concepts of language and that. So, and this is the first time that Jeremy Prynne and Eric Mottram have ever been in an anthology together. And Jeremy Prynne doesn't even really go into anthologies, as I understand, but he is in this one. So, there's a mixture of some of the Cambridge lot. So, this is, I'll just read some of the cast list of people in here. Anthony Barnett, Asa Benvenise, Paul Brown, me, Battle Bunty, and Brian Catlin, David Challen, Tom Clark, Bob Cobbin, Andrew Crozier, Paul Evans, Ian Hamilton Finney, Alan Fisher, Roy Fisher, Veronica Forrest Thompson, Glenda, Bill Griffiths, John Hall, Lee Harwood, Ray, Ralph Hawkins, Jeremy Hilton, Ansel Hollow, Michael Horowitz, Dom Sylvester Hodel, John James, Pierre Joris, Uli McCarthy, Barry McSweeney, Brian Marley, Richard Miller, Stuart Montgomery, Eric Motsham, Wendy Mulford, Jeff Nuttall, Doug Oliver, Tom Phillips, Tom Phillips is on the power. I'll see you